everybody, and welcome to The Wench Bench, where friends sit and talk about fabulous fictional females and how their stories have influenced us throughout our lives. My name is Allison. And my name is Nick. And you may be wondering, what happened to Fonda? Well, we are recording this during the COVID-19 pandemic, so... We're both on self-isolation in our homes with our husbands, and Nick is my husband, and today he has so graciously decided to join us as a guest. We will be releasing this as a little bit of bonus content for you all to help fill the hours of self-isolation, and I hope you enjoy it. Now, before we get into our topic, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Nick? So yeah, I'm in my mid-30s. I'm old enough now that I don't remember how old I am. Uh, I'm either 35 or 36. I thought about that in the shower <laughs> this morning, and I don't actually remember. Um, I, I manage a comic book store. I've been working there for about 15 years now. I don't know how long I've been the manager. I, I love comics. I love games. I love painting models. I love war games. Um, those are a lot of hobbies that uh, Allison and I enjoy together, so it's it's great. And uh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so today, Nick and I are actually going to be both discussing Ripley from the Alien franchise. Yes. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on Ripley, just so that you can get to know a little bit about who she is. Lieutenant Ellen Ripley is the warrant officer and third in command aboard the Nostromo a freight ship belonging to Wayland yutani Corporation. Appearing in the first four movies in the Alien franchise, Ripley is portrayed by Sigourney Weaver, who actually received her first Academy Award nomination for Best Actress for the second movie, Aliens. She is a qualified, smart, and brave woman who time and time again proves herself to be the most competent person in the room, or in these cases, on the ship. She's a single mother with a daughter named Amanda, who was around 10 when the events of the Alien movie take place. So in the original Alien movie, all the characters were written as unisex. They didn't really care who was what, except for Ripley. They wanted Ripley to be a male character, and, and she even had a different name. Or I guess he even had a different name. They even had a different name. Ooh. There you go. At some point, it was recommended to change the character to a female. Now, either by the Fox studio president or by the director. I read both. I'm not really sure which one it is, but that doesn't matter. Nope. As long as it happened. Ripley's a woman. There you go. And we're super excited about it. That's right. Because that means we get to talk about her today. That's right. That's right. No men allowed. <laughs> get out. That's right. So, Nick, why did you decide to talk about Ripley today? Well, Ripley is my favorite female protagonist, like in any form of fictional media, not just movies. I mean, comics. She's just my favorite. Uh, when I was a kid, probably either early high school or late elementary school, I don't really know when, I was asked, who's your favorite actress? And I, I didn't really have a, an answer to that. I never, I still to this day don't really have a favorite actor or actress. I just, you know, it just is what it is. I've never been like that. But uh, like as a kid, you know, I think my favorite actor was Arnold Schwarzenegger, just like pretty much everyone who grew up in the 90s favorite actor was Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> and I thought about it and I said well I guess it's Sigourney Weaver Sigourney Weaver's my favorite actress because she was Ripley mm -hmm. and Ripley was just this strong competent character you know I, I like that in my my action movies and my sci-fi movies and my horror movies I don't I don't necessarily in those kind of genres need a flawed character you know Ripley isn't flawed she's a victim of circumstance you know I, I don't need her to beat her personal demons I in these movies I need her to beat like almost literal demons right like right. that's you know I, I love a lot of I love a good drama I love a good character study movie you know but these kind of movies i enjoy these to see the interesting situation they're in and so you have this character like ripley and in a lot of ways a, a lot of my favorite male characters are pretty much just a male version of ripley and ripley <laughs> is a female version of say you know dutch from predator yes we did name our dog after an arnold schwarzenegger character from the movies predator that is how Mr. Dutch got his name. <laughs> you can't name a kid Dutch, but you can name a dog Dutch, so. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, these strong characters with few flaws may seem limited, but it's the strength of the actor and the script that makes them interesting to me. You know, these heroes are often the same, but the situation changes. Ripley is a strong and, and competent character, but she's just in a shitty but interesting situation. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's why I like her. Something like that makes me curious, too, if she would have been written as simple one might say if they had been trying to write for 
an actual like female actress maybe the the idea of everything immediately being written unisex was a strong point in this because they didn't get all caught up in their head trying to be like what would a woman do they were just like what would a person do in this situation which i find yeah like when you watch when you watch alien it's it's how they play these characters like you you kind of wonder like did they change the script because it was a female in certain situations or did they just change the way Sigourney Weaver acted in those situations mm-hmm. you know there's there's a scene where she confronts the science officer about something and you know had it been a male character probably would have come off like the exact same dialogue could have been used but probably would have been very gruff and like pinned him against the wall and be like listen here man you're busting my ass man <laughs> but in the actual movie she comes off as sort of like this like sarcastic you know and deliberately kind of nagging him you know because they're they're leaning into deliberately leaning into the the misogyny of the situation right mm-hmm. well not the misog- the chauvinism of the, the situation chauvinism, the, yes. the chauvinism of the situation the chauvinism of the situation exactly next i'm going to give a little bit of history on the production and the creation of the alien franchise for any of our listeners who maybe haven't seen the movies or don't know that much about them alien is a science fiction horror action media franchise the first movie was released in 1979 with sequels following in 86 92 and 97 Alien was directed by Ridley Scott and written by Dan O'Bannon. Yeah, Dan O'Bannon actually had a nervous breakdown before uh, this movie was made. This <laughs> Writing the script and uh, developing this movie was actually what got him out of that funk. He was a part of a team for Alejandro Jodorowsky's failed Dune movie, which was a collection of just a bunch of weirdo artists making what would have been like the craziest movie of all time. And after... Uh, after O'Bannon came out of that funk, he brought a lot of those weirdos with him to Alien, actually. It really seems like this movie came out at a time when studios were actually taking chances on weirdos. There's a lot of cult classics and (laughs) favorites that have come out of that era of sci-fi that maybe weren't great back then, but now have developed this sort of fanfare that so many people like and enjoy nowadays. Yeah, some people might not understand what it was really like at that period of time in filmmaking. There was this really this pre and post Star Wars era where, you know, Star Wars had to make a lot of their own special effects equipment because so many Hollywood studios had just gotten rid of all that stuff. They just weren't interested in special effects anymore. They wanted just dramas and things like that and comedies. What ended up kind of happening was that when Star Wars hit, and was just such a monster, like not just in terms of the, the movie box office, but all the merchandise. You know, you had all these older studio heads who just did not understand it, but they knew it made money. So they gave a, a bunch of money to a bunch of weirdo artists to make movies that they didn't understand. And they just gave them, said, here, like, do whatever you want. We don't get this. <laughs> Go nuts. And a lot of them did. And that's why there's this weird kind of golden age um, of science fiction from the late 70s to the, I'd say like even like late late 80s of these movies and I'll, the truth is a lot of them flopped yeah like they've, they've attained cult status now but they just missed the mark with the audience but they're these amazing movies made by really talented people who were just strange and it, it took a while for those studios to catch on that hey wait a minute like they're not all <laughs> going to be star wars man like some of these things are goddamn weird yeah they're not all going to be alien <laughs> exactly right it also seems like a lot of these movies have that longevity they do come back they do become cult classics A movie like Alien has a bunch of re-releases. Yeah, like Aliens, you know, they have like a 30th anniversary. They just had a 40th anniversary edition. You know, it's a really strong, well-made movie created by really talented people. And it holds up over time. I mean, Alien was a was a success at the time but movies like the thing like the thing tanked but Mm -hmm. same thing with the thing it has like these anniversary editions again and again and again and you know i mean you look at comic book movies now and they they really just follow a formula i mean yeah people say like oh these are science fiction action movies too it's like yeah but they just follow a really safe formula i mean iron man 3 was a billion dollar movie but 30 years from now we're going to be celebrating iron man 3 the way we're celebrating you know alien still yeah maybe not i mean yeah some people believe they still belong to the same genre but like i said these were weird artists doing passion projects and it really shows and that's why i said these movies hold up yeah and i do think it really comes down to that creativity which is abundant yeah. in these films as i mentioned this movie was met with critical acclaim and box office success Nowadays, there are articles and many people who claim that it deserves a place among the greatest films of all time. 
When uh, I have this debate with people a lot where we talk about the greatest movies of all time and people kind of generically say, oh, it's either Citizen Kane or The Godfather. And I kind of say, well, what about other alternatives? And the two movies I usually argue for what else could be considered the greatest movie of all time is Unforgiven by Clint Eastwood Mm -hmm. and uh, An Alien. And the reason why I argue Alien is just because of the sheer strength of the, the creative talent in this movie. You know, there's so many good ideas. There's so many amazing character designs, set designs, prop designs. You know, just the alien itself is just amazing. This movie is is in a really is an artistic genius. You know, and I think it really deserves to be in that category, like in that in, in that debate at least. You know, it's like yeah, you could argue that this is one of the greatest movies of all time because you just look at it and this is it's just incredible. It's just it's it's like I said, it's, it's a form of genius. Yeah. Nick and I actually just rewatched it last night. Yes. Since all this talking and research got us in the in the alien mood. Yep, time for a binge watch. Yeah, rewatching it again. It's just it's still I can watch that movie so many times over and over again and still mm-hmm. love it. And another point that I think makes a really great movie. Because of this movie's success, it has spawned a massive media franchise including books, comics, video games, toys and films including two crossover movies with the predator franchise and two prequels that's actually how i first discovered the world of alien and ripley was that when i was a kid i went to the toy store and there was just this new line of action figures on the wall and they were these kind of bright colorful almost superhero gi joe toys that were fighting alien monsters yeah and i really had no idea what they were I'd never seen them before I heard of them. When I saw the Ripley toy, I actually assumed it was this little Asian boy. <laughs> because a lot of cartoons around that time had this smart little Asian boy character. Like, it's a terrible, like, cultural stereotype of yeah. the, 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 these young Asian boy who was, like, the computer hacker or something like that. Yeah. And I kind of just, by programming, assumed that that's what this this Ripley character was because it was a smaller yeah. version than the other characters. Yeah. It didn't really look very feminine. Yeah. Um, so I didn't even realize it was a girl. Um, so that's how I first found out about Ripley. And when you think about that, that's actually really weird. I don't think a lot of people understand that, you know, growing up in, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of action figure lines and Sunday or Saturday morning cartoons that were based on rated R movies. I mean, there was Alien, there was Toxic Avenger to Toxic Crusader, there was Conan the Barbarian to Conan the Adventurer, there was Robocop, there was Terminator, there was Predator, and then there was this weird line of Aliens action figure. And it came from a, a sort of aborted cartoon pitch, like a Saturday morning cartoon they were going to do about aliens. It was called Operation <laughs> Aliens. Sure. <laughs> and I mean, you think about that, like, yeah, like these, these character designs that came up with were really cool. They were based on the movie, but I mean, they were all wearing bright, colorful clothes, like street clothes. They weren't, you know, only a couple of them had like the military fatigues so that was really weird for me having first discovered <laughs> alien this way then watching the movie and be like yeah like where's where's like a pone's backwards hat <laughs> and when you when you think about that in the long term like what really was their plan like yeah you have these cool soldiers with big guns and big vehicles fighting these cool alien monsters but like what parts of the of the movie franchise were they going to bring over because my friend cody he had an he had an alien action figure where you pressed a, bu- a button on the back and his chest exploded <laughs> like the head blew off the two arms blew off and there was like these internal organs they weren't very detailed but you think about like what the hell and they also had action figures of like the face huggers and the queen alien with the second mouth you know spoiler alert about the movies here like you know when the when the impreg- when these people impregnated with these aliens like when these aliens come out they they explode through your goddamn chest and like <laughs> how are they going to address that in a kids cartoon was it always just going to be like don't know we got to the alien we saved them before the alien got out of them <laughs> like how how are, what was their plan for that and i'm sure that's probably why the the cartoon got canceled probably yeah, yeah. May, may very well have been so one summer when I was visiting family, I really wanted to watch all these movies. I was probably about nine years old at the time. So we went and rented them all. I watched them, the third one first, because that was the first one we were able to find from the video store. And that's when I realized that I had also seen, um, because Ripley has a shaved head in this movie, I'd seen a, a large cardboard standout at my local movie store. I was like, oh, right, that's, that's the shaved head girl. <laughs> so I'd seen that before. And then we watched the first one, and then we watched the second one. Like I said, as, as a kid, I was really surprised. Like, why are their costumes all different? But, I mean, these movies scared the shit out of me. I, I literally <laughs> ran screaming from the room. I don't even think I watched all of the second one uh, the first time we watched it because I think I, yeah, I ran from the room screaming because it was just so goddamn terrifying. Yeah, especially for a nine-year-old. <laughs> exactly. And there was a, there's a scene in the third one 
where they're in a in a med lab but they have those curtains all around them and as a kid it reminded me of a bath curtain <laughs> that's fair um, so as a kid um when i would go take a bath i would like open the shower curtain and then i would look up and make sure that there wasn't like i knew i was old enough to know but you still have enough of an imagination at a nine ten year old that you're like yeah like i know there's no alien up there but i'm gonna open the curtain and just check just in case i mean like i know it's not real better safe than sorry just in case that thing fucking comes down and punches his little second mouth through my skull. <laughs> you know, like, these are really gory, violent movies. They are. And, you know, I, more to that, you know, when I was a kid, I had Robocop toys when I was probably about five, six years old. <laughs> and so I asked my parents, like, hey, can we watch the Robocop movie? And they're like, yeah, of course, why not? <laughs> and there's, like, really gory scenes where they're just <laughs> shooting the shit out of people and people are blown up and exploding. <laughs> There I was, this four or five year old, or five or six year old, just, oh yeah, whatever. So probably didn't even understand what it was. Probably not. <laughs> Before we really get into the alien movies, I'm going to tell you a little bit of backstory about the world so that we don't have to try and then explain it when I'm covering stories and synopses, synopses and stuff. Yeah. Synopses? I don't know. Sure. Synapses? Syn- <laughs> <laughs> No. (laughs) Oh, that's got to be different. (laughs) That is different. Okay. These movies take place in a future that is run by capitalism and greed, far from the idyllic universe of Star Trek that many like to hope the future will be. (laughs) This is probably a little bit more what the future will actually be. (laughs) Yeah, we're not that far off. (laughs) No. Wayland Utani Corporation is the driving force behind the plot of these movies. It is primarily a technology supplier manufacturing synthetics, spaceships, and computers for a wide range of industrial and commercial clients, making them a household name. So like a pretty big... (laughs) Sexy. Pretty big deal. (laughs) Evil Mastercraft. Evil Mastercraft. Evil Black and Decker. (laughs) They are also in charge of many off-world operations, such as colonizing, shipping, and transportation. This is boring, but... It actually does help with backstory and understanding. Yeah. Like it's a, yeah, exactly, right. It's, it's the big evil corporation trope, but yeah. I mean it's not done poorly. It's it's, yeah. it's, it's done extremely well. Yeah. Uh, they are actually intentionally portrayed as encompassing all the worst aspects of corporate profiteering. It is all about the bottom line and human life is considered expendable. Mm-hmm. Basically, All you need to know is that from the top CEOs down to the freight hall drivers, greed rules, and almost everybody is only looking out for themselves. Yeah, this future sucks. It's not good. Yeah, it's not happy. It's actually a pretty good portrayal of the idea of dirty space. Things like Star Wars, Firefly, kind of. Yeah. Not futuristic beautiful like jetsons but exactly and and they borrowed yeah. from star wars on that on the ship design like star trek has that really smooth exterior ships whereas mm-hmm. the, the ship designs in a- the world of alien are all very rough you know there's a lot of bits and bobs and all sorts of shit on the outsides of the ships. it doesn't it's not very practical because you'd have to go on the outside of the ship to fix that shit yeah. you know that's why star trek says yeah like all the internal stuff is on it's on the inside. Yeah, it's on the inside. Like, all the important <laughs> stuff is on the inside, you know? But this, yeah, uh, all that shit's on the outside. Yeah, it's, it's not sexy. It's, 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 it's made to look the opposite of sleek, you know? Like, they yeah. don't want this to look nice. Grungy. Exactly, grungy. <laughs> dirty. Plus dirty space. Plus dirty space. That's right. So the best place to start is at the very beginning, with Alien. I'm going to give you a quick synopsis, and then we'll... Synopsis. You said synopsis. Did I say synopsis? Yeah, synopsis. Fuck. I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of each of the movies, and then Nick is going to give us the color. That's right. (laughs) The crew aboard the commercial freight ship Nostromo is awakened from stasis due to a distress beacon and company policy stating that they must investigate. They land on the nearby moon LV-426, sustaining damage due to the treacherous atmosphere and rocky landscape. An away team goes to investigate while our heroine remains aboard, along with the two engineers who must fix the ship and Ash, the science officer. The away team find an abandoned spacecraft that is unmistakably alien. Inside, they discover a room full of eggs, and while inspecting them, Executive Officer Kane is attacked by a strange spider creature that leaps from the egg. It melts through his helmet and attaches itself to his face, 
While the team is away, Ripley discovers the beacon is not one of distress, but warning. Captain Dallas and Navigator Lambert return to the ship carrying Kane, but Ripley, acting as senior officer, refuses to let them aboard due to quarantine measures. Ash overrides this and lets them aboard anyways. In trying to remove the creature, they discover it has acid for blood, and it eventually dies on its own, releasing Kane seemingly unharmed. Before returning to stasis, the crew sits down for a final meal where we get the famous chestburster scene and so begins the fight against the alien, or xenomorph, as we come to know the species. Throughout this struggle, the crew are slowly killed one by one, and we discover Ash is in fact an android who was secretly ordered to bring back the alien. This all culminates in Ripley blowing up the Nostromo and escaping on a shuttle, but the alien has stowed away as well, and she must fight it off while in her underwear. Using her wit, she defeats the creature and settles into her stasis chamber, along with her cat, Jones, for the long trip home. Because, of course, it was in her underwear. Because it had to be in her underwear. <laughs> Apparently, originally, it was, she was just going to be naked, so the, up, the underwear was an upgrade. <laughs> for all their progressive feminism, they're just like, put that bitch in her underpants. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, she was wearing too many clothes for the rest of the exactly. movie. Exactly. <laughs> and as we watched it, the movie again last night like these are the least functional underwear in the planet <laughs> it's almost like somebody was like yeah this is what women's underwear looks like right yeah, like, somebody who had never seen women's underwear before exactly one of these one of the one of these weirdo artists that worked on the movie was just like well it's only supposed to go halfway up your ass right like it's <laughs> like literally only goes halfway up her ass <laughs> And as much as Nick and I would like to dig into every part of this movie, I do leave a decent amount out of all the synopses for these because these movies are so full of action and creativity and fun and story that I'm going to try and sum up as quick as I can and we're going to try and just talk about the parts that are important and I think going to be the most interesting yeah i mean i can't sit here and just describe to you like in detail like how tense these scenes are and how they carry for these long notes and <laughs> i don't think you want me to describe you know <laughs> what the motion tracker looks like and be like oh that's an ice cube tray on the side of it like <laughs> you just gotta look at the goddamn thing all right watch the movie <laughs> do it <laughs> yeah god damn it so what scenes do you want to talk about today nick well one of my favorite scenes is one of the most iconic scenes from the movie is what's called the space jockey scene. So when they get to the planet and they first go on the alien ship, there's this giant set they built where they come in contact with, which is one of my favorite sci-fi ideas, like a cliche, I guess you could call, which is the, the dead space captain. Where they find a ship somewhere and there's just the, the skeletal remains of a space captain. So like, what the hell happened here? Except when they do it in Alien, it's this giant creature that they create. I mean... His head is probably the size of the character's torsos, and they mm -hmm. and they 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 used actually child actors in suits, uh, in spacesuits, to sort of contrast the size difference, okay, to, to cool. overemphasize the size difference. And the space jockey is just this giant alien creature that kind of his head sort of blends into his chest, his chest blends into this chair, and then it all blends into this giant telescope thing that you assume he's some kind of navigator or something. It's this mm -hmm. really crazy design that they just came up with and built this huge set for. And it's a, it's only a couple minutes in the movie, but it really, like, holy shit, like, this is clearly foreign. This is clearly not something we understand. And when you look at the, again, when you look at the character's head and how it molds or how it blends into his chest, it's just, it's so strange and it's just so creative and it's just so genius. And then they just leave. And that's, <laughs> and it's not really a throwaway idea, but again, it's like, it's a couple, two minutes and they never come back to this alien. They never <laughs> do anything with this character ever again. And you're just like, well, what the hell was that thing? Never mind the rest of the movie. What the hell was that thing? And it's just this gorgeous gorgeous set piece and this gorgeous character design they came up with as we talked about earlier there's a prequel to alien and that's called prometheus and prometheus goes back and they deal with these space jockeys unfortunately they didn't do a terribly good job they they really humanized them and they they shrunk them down and they made them really accessible and which i, I think took a lot away from them because when you when you look at them you know for the last 30 years up until prometheus came out for the, that 30 there was 30 years where we just had no idea what these things were. Mm -hmm. And there was just so much imagination and wonderment where you're like, what, what is this? What does it all mean? And then they do a movie and it's like, oh, that's it? Like, that's all it means? It's just a really big human. Yeah, just a really big humanoid. And he was yeah. wearing a spacesuit. Yeah. And, Whereas yeah. if you do, like, look at it, if you, if you pause and you really take a look at it, it's not 
particularly humanoid. Not the really, The way no. that it, it joins in with the chair. And the whole spaceship is really an intriguing biomechanical design. Like, it yes. all looks very natural in a way, but unnatural to yes, us, which is really cool. It really uneases you because you yeah. recognize it, but it's like... It's like that clip on YouTube where you see someone supposedly having a stroke on a newscast where you you know all these words, but just not in that order. And it just, you know, it sounds familiar. It looks familiar, but you're just not not in that order. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it just really uneases you uh, as, the, as the viewer. Like, ah, like I, I kind of understand, but I don't understand. Yeah. Right. And you're like, what, what does this mean? Like, what is this? You know, that's not where that's supposed to go. And so yeah. just, oh, just so creative. Now, probably the most iconic scene uh, of Alien is the dinner scene. Now, this is right after uh, Kane has come back to the ship and the parasite, the, the face hugger, has fallen off of his face and he's seemingly okay. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, the, the crew's kind of just sitting there kind of thinking to themselves like, oh, well, I guess the alien just couldn't survive in our atmosphere because they were wearing spacesuits when they were on that atmosphere. I guess it just shriveled up and died. You know, kind of <laughs> like finding like a dead spider somewhere that's died, you know, but it wasn't squashed. You just like, oh, okay. I guess we're okay. Yeah, I guess it's yeah. dead. And again, remember, this is 1979. A lot of those 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 movie stereotypes and tropes hadn't don't exist yet. Like they, they yeah. exist because of Alien. And so the crew is like, well, I guess it's time for dinner. <laughs> and they go around the dinner table, and this is the famous scene where Kane starts having like seemingly like he's choking or having a heart attack, and then this blood shoots out of his chest, and all of a sudden it just rips out of his goddamn chest. And there's this bloody little monster that comes running out of him. And just everyone's screaming and freaks out. And it really, it's so well made, it holds up to this day. About 10 years ago or so, I, I showed these movies to a friend of mine who had never seen any of the Alien movies. And they looked at me when we came up to this scene and was like, well, wait a minute, what are they doing? And I paused the movie, I was like, what do you mean? Like, like why, are they, why are they eating dinner with that guy? Like, he's sick. And I looked at them <laughs> and I said, like, do you, do you have no idea what's coming? And they said, no, 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 I don't actually. Like, I, I, I was like, you've never seen this scene parodied? You have, you've never seen anything? Nope. I was like, cool. And I just <laughs> pressed the play button. And they lost their shit when that alien came out of there. Just lost their mind. And I was just, it was so cool to watch someone see that for the first time. Because I would seen it before I'd ever seen the movie. I'd, I'd seen it parodied. Like, mm -hmm. if you haven't seen Godfather ever and you watch Godfather, you've probably seen, you'll, you'll go like, holy crap. Like, I've seen this movie a million times in parody form yeah right and so I, as a kid i had seen that scene somewhere else you know parodied before i ever saw it in the movies and i was like oh yeah right that scene yeah so the other thing about alien that most people <laughs> notice but don't kind of understand it's kind of a little bit more subconscious is they kind of sit there and go like man like the, the thing look, kind of looks like a penis because by now <laughs> what you've seen is you've seen the face hugger and the face hugger when they peel it off they kind of dissect it and you kind of sitting there going like, God, that kind of looks like a vagina, you know? Like, oh, I don't want to say anything, but that kind of looks. Like... And they even kind of like prod at some things, and you kind of like you really look at it, you're like, what is that? The... It kind of looks like a clitoris. <laughs> and then this monster I just described that pops out of the chest. I mean, people have always kind of jokingly described it as like, you know, like the the, the bloody little penis monster. You know, it looks kind of like a penis. <laughs> You know, and then later on in the movie, when you see the actual large scale alien xenomorph, he's got this long tube head and it's got this at the end of it, it's kind of got this head to his head, like this tip to his head. <laughs> and even when, you know, he's got a secondary mouth that jets out of his out of his face, you know, it's, it's just this kind of tube that just goes around penetrating people. And it's all, you know, people kind of get kind of uncomfortable and squeamish like this movie is. It's really kind of phallic. Like, can you believe they did that by accident? Like, <laughs> can you believe this happened? Like, then, that nobody noticed? No, it 100% goddamn was on purpose. <laughs> it is all dicks and vaginas all day on purpose because of one of those weird little artists I told you about named H.R. Giger. <laughs> now, H.R. Giger was this weird little Swiss surrealist painter, sculptor, set designer. You know, he worked on these movies. And like I said, it, with Giger all day, every day, dicks and vaginas. When they brought him in, the original kind of rough sketches of the alien was very was very much just a regular kind of alien you would expect. And then he showed up with all his tuby ribbed dick drawings <laughs> and all like the, the spaceship, all the interiors of the spaceship, the alien. It all has like, you, as you mentioned earlier, this biomechanical kind of ribbed design to it. A lot of tubes, a lot yeah. of sheaths, a lot of, you know, all this stuff, a lot, 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 lot of ribbing, right? Yeah. 
all Giger, all dicks. Like, he's just <laughs> in love with it. Uh, Giger has this one famous painting. It's nicknamed the penis landscape, where it's just a, a landscape weave drawing of dicks weaving into vaginas. There's, <laughs> there's Some of them are wearing condoms. It's just like, go ahead and Google it. Google H.R. Giger penis landscape and look at it for yourself. It is 100% intentional. Dicks all day, every day. It is a great picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that picture. <laughs> So this kind of leads into this, there's this camp, I guess, this theory that the alien movies are actually misogynistic uh, because they really, they really vilify women and, and, and horrifying aspects of childbirth, mm-hmm. right? You know, particularly in the second movie, Aliens, you know, when the queen alien comes out, you know, yes. spoiler alert, we're getting ahead of ourselves there. But it really kind of is like, yeah, like women are evil, women are the villains, and childbirth is this horrible, awful thing. And I don't. I can see that point. I can see why people would say that, but I, I don't see that at all. Actually, I don't. I don't agree with it. To be honest, I, I think what they are doing with this is they're just taking nature and parasites and cranking it up to eleven. You know, when I was in high school, I always remember this picture of an ant that had been infected with a spore, and then a parasite, like a little mushroom, grew out of the ant. Like the mm-hmm. ant was dead on his back, and it had this little mushroom sticking out of his chest. You know, like this is nature is quite horrifying with with parasites and things like that. Yeah. So I don't I don't agree that they're trying to vilify women and vilify childbirth with this at all. Me neither. You know, however, there's another theory which I think is much more plausible that the alien movies scare uh, men particularly because it forces them to get fucked in the face and them to have babies. Yeah. and you know childbirth already scares men because a they don't have the equipment for it b they don't have to do it and (laughs) it's just like they don't understand it so it's like oh my god that's goddamn horrifying it's just something they just don't want to deal with so this movie forces men you know and women mind you but it forces men particularly to become the child bearers (laughs) and like i said they don't have the equipment so it's not coming out of their dicks it's coming to rip its way out of their insides like that's the way i think they are preying on men who view childbirth as as scary it's like this is what you this is exactly what you think happens that women get like like just ah just they get just fucked and then ah, and now it's happening to you yeah so a little bit too i feel on like that toxic masculinity of like oh how dare that thing penetrate like me a man (laughs) exactly right yes you know and that's the thing is that you know in alien it's yeah it's a little it's a it's a little vagina spider it's a little bloody penis monster and then it's a big (laughs) dickhead monster and then later in prometheus there's this part in prometheus where they've changed the face hugger so it's it's not really a vagina spider anymore it's a it's a it's a little dick snake (laughs) and just like the face hugger like it it attaches itself to your face and uh and then impregnates you and when I was watching the movie, or after I'd watched the movie, you know, I, people were kind of talking like, man, like, can you believe, like, it kind of looked like, you know, that little the little face hugger was, you know, forcing the guy to give it a blowjob. Like, can you believe they did that? I was like, yes, 100%. That's what they were doing. <laughs> they were making that alien fuck you in the mouth. Like, to make you even more uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Like, they're like, oh, yeah, you've already seen, you've already seen your face get attacked by a vagina. Now you're going to see, see your face get attacked by a dick snake. <laughs> they're going to fuck you in the mouth. <laughs> So again, do I think this was intentional? Like they were trying to really make people uncomfortable about birth? No, like I said, I think they were just taking nature and cranking it up to 11, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but can I picture, you know, Giger sitting there with O'Bannons and they're talking about like, yeah, and then the, so then the little dick monster is going to fuck you in the face. <laughs> and then the men will have some babies. Yeah. Yeah, it is a very sexual creature. <laughs> it is a penis and a vagina and it blow. Yeah, like 100% Giger. <laughs> Giger was up to dick monsters and vagina <laughs> monsters and probably thought it was just the funniest shit on the planet because he's a weird little Swiss guy. It was a terrible impression of Dr. Strangelove, by the way. Okay, pause it. In my opinion, like, kind of similar to yours, is it's always just been a creepy movie to me, but then when you do talk about it with, like, some guys... They tend to talk about how phallic it is all the time. And I was like, ah, I, I didn't really see it that way. But that's maybe because more women don't necessarily get uncomfortable at the idea of phallic imagery. I guess. Yeah. Dicks but, come at them all day anyway. Yeah, so. I guess. Yeah. Or men are scared of that thing, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's supposed to be subtle and not subtle. Like, it's an alien, right? So if it has this big, long head, you know... Uh, it's just an alien, right? Like, that's what aliens look like. Yeah. But they're sitting there going, like, kind of looks like a 
dick to me it's supposed to like 100 yeah. percent, and it's supposed to make you feel just a little bit uncomfortable and weird mm-hmm. again like is that because they were intentionally doing that or is that just because giger is a weirdo a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. I don't know. Both? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think what happened was Giger showed up to the set one day with these drawings, and they were just like, that's fucking great. Yeah. You know, I don't think they are like, hey, draw us a dick monster. You yeah. Because we want to make the, you know, it, it was a happy accident, but Giger's probably sitting in the corner going, <laughs> yes, this is a dick monster. <laughs> yeah. So your, they made my dick monster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah. So all your friends are like, oh my God, do you think it looks like a penis? Yeah, dipshit, it does. <laughs> fucking prude <laughs> one of the things this movie does do is it does prey on your your prejudice and your bias towards women i don't want to say misogyny towards women but your your bias towards women and what roles they should have in the movie yeah because your your learned bias the things exactly. that were taught our entire lives basically yeah um because Sigourney weaver was not the top build star tom skerritt who plays dallas who's the captain, he was the top build star. And Alien is one of those movies like Psycho, like Scream, like Godzilla, uh, the, the 2014 version, I believe, where the big name actor you're expecting to be the hero all the way through the movie die quite early in the movie. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's that's another trick they use. Like, oh, wait, like, what happened to the cool captain? Like, you know, now, now who's in charge? You know? And they've done, up until the point that Dallas dies, they've done this job this good job of making you view Ripley as like a buzzkill, as like shrew Ripley. Like, oh yeah. my God, here comes the nag. You know, she won't let us back on the ship. She's, you know, holding people accountable for the, the things they screwed <laughs> up. Like when she when she confronts the doctor, as I mentioned, you know, yes. they, they, they make her kind of be sarcastic and snide with him. You know, yeah. like, yeah, like, what were you doing? Like, you, you know, you weren't doing your job right, right? But she's very much correct. And she's yeah. very much... In every one of these situations where they portray her as kind of this nag, she's actually right about everything, and she says things like, you know, like, if we do this, there's a good chance we're all going to die from it. And they're just like, yeah, we don't care. We want to party kind of thing. Yeah. And they all goddamn die for it. She says it multiple times. Like, exactly. Like, you are putting the rest of the crew at risk by doing this, and she's the only one that lives, mm-hmm. so. And they won't listen to her because she's the woman. Yeah. You know? And they have this other female character, Lambert, in there, and Lambert is much more of the, the damsel um stereotype character where she's kind yeah. of crying and kind of a panicky idiot most of the time and can't yeah. hold it together and you know they're like god damn it lambert move 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 like we gotta we gotta kill this thing and she's so frozen in terror but ripley is constantly engaging the problem yeah. you know and yes she gets emotional and she has these outbursts but it's because no one will goddamn listen to her like she's frustrated she's not a panicky idiot yeah you know and they they, they very deliberately prey on that uh, as you as the audience member you they know you're gonna sit there and think like well the woman's not gonna do it you know <laughs> where's the man and you know not just you know captain dallas but one of the engineers is a large male character too right and so you kind of think oh he's gonna you know he's the tough gruff character and they, they kind of even say in the movie like yeah like you need to calm down man like you think he's gonna go in there and kick this alien's ass he's the only one who can save them it couldn't yeah. be shrew ripley right they also like devalue her bravery at points too like when dallas is gonna go into the ventilation system. Yes. Ripley is actually the first one to volunteer. And she Before very... they say anything else, Ripley's like, I'm going into that ventilation shaft to chase out the alien. And she says it very quietly. She says, I'll do it. You yeah. know? And no one acknowledges it, you know? And then, you know, Captain <laughs> so Dallas. Yeah, yeah, here comes Captain Dallas. <laughs> because Ripley is actually, as you mentioned earlier, Ripley is third in command. And by this point in the movie, the second in command has died already. Yeah. That's, that's Kane. He's died. And everything that captain dallas has done by this point is wrong and then (laughs) she's almost using the chain of command to be like look like uh, you're in charge i'll go do it like the first officer should go do it not the captain yeah and then what happens yeah captain dallas goes out there and he gets himself killed you know she's the only one making the right decisions and everybody else is making all the wrong (laughs) decisions so she's very competent and yeah everybody gets themselves killed and like you know like you said she not only saves herself, but she saves the goddamn cat. <laughs> the ship cat. <laughs> the ship cat Jones. So, yeah. Everybody else's, Jones. everybody else's track records are terrible. <laughs> She's coming out with a plus one. And again, this is all very intentional. They are preying on you thinking these normal ways by, by societal standards that this weak woman can't save the day when all the men... A should be the ones to save the day, and B like <laughs> they can't do it. Like how could she possibly do it? You know, it's all very intentional. Cause Ripley's a badass. That's right. Exactly. Now we're getting to the movie that really solidifies Ripley's badass title. 
And that right. is Aliens. A.K.A. Badass Ripley Two Guns. <laughs> this uh, recaps a little longer, but that's because this movie is absolutely wild. And I love it. And in all fairness, there's, there's a lot more going on in this movie. There you know, is. The first movie is very much like, we are stranded with a predator. What yeah. do we do about it? This movie, a little bit more going on, per se. Yeah. Alien ended with Ripley taking Jones into a stasis chamber and hoping that the shuttle was going to be picked up by a rescue crew within a couple weeks. Turns out that she is awakened by the Wayland yutani Corp 57 years in the future. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. She is then informed by a representative named Carter Burke that her daughter has actually died while she has been asleep. She is then questioned and gaslit by the company, who says that LV-426 is completely safe and that there is now a colony living on the moon. No sign of aliens. Yeah! (laughs) She returns to Earth for a time and finds work as a dockyard power loader operator. Shortly after this, though, contact is lost with the colony, and Wayland yutani has decided to send in a group of colonial marines to investigate. Space G.I. Joes, my favorite. <laughs> they ask that Ripley go along with them as a civilian observer, since she's the only person who they have access to that has actually been on the planet. And she agrees only on the promise that they are going to destroy the aliens and not recover any specimens yeah because I, I think at this point she they don't they still don't believe her but they're just like hey just in case come along with us yeah, yeah yeah the marines are also skeptical of her claims about her previous encounter with aliens on this moon and she is actually skeptical of one of her fellow crew who is in fact an android by the name of bishop Ripley eventually wins over the Marines with her competence and skills. Once the team arrives at the colony, they find it deserted, with signs of resistance but no bodies. And, to none of our surprise, two live facehugger specimens in containment tanks. They do discover a young girl, the seemingly lone survivor, named Newt. Eventually, the team locates the colonists who have been cocooned by creatures in a hive beneath the fusion-powered atmosphere processing station. Because the guns have armor-piercing bullets, Ripley strongly suggests that they do not use their machine guns, but instead use pistols and flamethrowers. The Marines discover one woman who is still alive just before a chestburster rips its way out of her ribcage. They kill it with fire, but... (laughs) This rouses multiple adult xenomorphs who attack and kill many of the Marines, including Sergeant Apone, the experienced field commander. Ripley, who had stayed on the armored personnel carrier with Burke and the very green Lieutenant Gorman... Lieutenant no experience. (laughs) ...sees that the Marines are dying and takes control of the situation since Gorman is panicking, and she ends up saving Corporal Hicks and Privates Hudson and Vasquez. Hicks... Now, the commanding officer, instead of Gorman because he is incapacitated, orders the dropship to rescue the survivors, but an alien kills the pilots, leaving them stranded on the surface. While barricaded in the colony, Ripley discovers that Burke is not the friendly man his sweater vests imply, but he is a company man through and through, and he had ordered the colonists to investigate the crashed alien ship. Bishop also discovers that the dropship crash had damaged the power plant cooling system, and it was only a matter of time before the whole thing exploded. He volunteers to go to a transmitter in order to pilot the remaining dropship so that they can escape. While waiting, Ripley and Newt fall asleep in a medical laboratory, only to discover that Burke had put the two living facehuggers in the room with them. Bastard. (laughs) And then he locked the door behind them and turned off the security cameras. His intention was for them to be impregnated so that they could then smuggle the chestbursters through the quarantine to get them to Earth. Ripley, being the smart woman she is, triggers the fire alarm, which alerts the Marines who come to the rescue. The power gets cut and the aliens attack the group. Newt is captured while everyone but Ripley and Hicks are killed. The two reach Bishop in the dropship. 
but Ripley refuses to leave Newt and goes back for her with a rigged together pulse rifle slash flamethrower. Badass Ripley two guns! <laughs> Luckily, Hicks had given Ripley a tracker bracelet, which he insisted was just a precaution that she had subsequently given to Newt. She manages to rescue Newt and the small trauma family of Ripley, Hicks, Newt, and Bishop return to the main ship. What they don't know is the Queen Xenomorph had managed to stow away on the drop ship, and she attacks Bishop once they land, ripping him in half. An awesome fight occurs involving a power loader suit and the line, Get away from her, you bitch! It ends with the Queen being sucked out into space. Now safe, Ripley treats Hicks's wounds, and the group then enters hypersleep for their return journey to Earth. The end. <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> or so they think. <laughs> or so they hope. Jesus. Yeah. Christ. <laughs> they, they, they should not go into hyperspace or hypersleep in these movies. They should no. just age regularly and pilot the fucking ship. Yeah. <laughs> Just stay awake. I think it's, stay what, awake. 10 months? Yeah, stay awake. Yeah. Grow a beard, man. <laughs> Shit. I unfortunately don't think they have enough food. Yeah, spoiler alert, there's a third movie, and it's not on Earth. It's <laughs> hypersleep. It screws them again. Yay, hypersleep. So, clearly tons of awesome stuff in this movie. Yeah. Uh, what do you want to focus on? <laughs> okay, so uh, Aliens is actually not only my favorite of all the Alien movies, Aliens is actually my favorite movie of all time. Uh, that's not actually true. Um, <laughs> that's usually what I just tell people when they ask me what my favorite movie is, is because my actual favorite movie of all time is Transformers the movie, like the animated movie from 1986. I just, when you tell people your favorite movie of all time is a cartoon, they go, no, 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 but like a real movie. <laughs> and so I tell them Aliens. Now, don't get me wrong. It's pretty much 1A and 1B, like they're neck and neck. But if I could only pick one movie that I have to watch for the rest of my life, it would be Transformers. Nice. You know, I love Aliens. It's such an amazing movie, but just a slight nod to Transformers the movie. <laughs> and this movie is the one that really solidifies why Ripley is my favorite female character of all time. I mean, it's just like I said, I can't stress it enough. Badass Ripley two guns. Yeah. You know what I mean, she is always right. You know, <laughs> she's always doing the right thing. She's she spent the poor woman spends her like entire movie career being like, fine, fuck, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, and this movie really hammers it home. A couple of the scenes that really stand out to me in this movie um, at the beginning there, you know, when she's got that kind of company tribunal where they're kind of being like, look, like, why did you commit the heinous crime of property damage? <laughs> you know, and she's explaining to them, like, look, like we encountered something. And it killed all of us. And this is the only way to do it. And they're just kind of like, yeah, 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 whatever. But why did you blow up the ship? It's this really <laughs> weird kind of like they're really hammering home like how awful capitalism yeah. is. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of this weird scene. It's just like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, yeah, everyone's dead. But, you know, you really you blew up that goddamn ship. Yeah. It was, it's a, they say something like a substantial dollar value attached to it. Yeah. And well, the thing that you'd think that they would be most upset about is the very plausible theory that Ripley snapped, murdered her entire crew, and then blew up the ship. Yeah. <laughs> but no, they don't care about the crew dying. No, they no, no, no. They don't care no. about the idea of alien life. Yeah. According to this scene, I don't believe that they don't believe her, but <laughs> I think they know exactly what happened Yeah, on you that think ship. they're gaslighting her. Yeah, I think they're gaslighting yeah, the shit out of her. covering their tracks kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, don't care about the people that are dead. Just, how dare you get rid of all of our good good ore yeah our good mineral ore that we had 57 years ago oh my god <laughs> fuck so then we jump ahead a little bit here to uh when the marines are prepping the spaceship and, you know and, and again ripley is a trained crew member of a spaceship you know she knows what she's doing and then she asks like hey can i help i don't i feel like a third wheel around here like what can i do and uh she runs this is where they show that she knows how to run the power loader suit which is basically like robot forklift armor yeah you know this will come in handy later but they do it they, they did such a good job of integrating that into the story where they make it look like she's proving herself to sergeant apone and corporal hicks and they have this this little moment where she's got like this big missile loaded up and she's kind of like says like where do you want it like oh, oh i see what you did there <laughs> sexually yeah windows. she's talking about dicks <laughs> <laughs> um and they do a really good job of of camouflaging the fact that they're showing you this is what a power loader is and she knows how to use it because most movies have this awful moment in them where I call it the, like, the this fucking thing, a scene, where out of nowhere, 
they just show you this device and someone's like, hey, what's that fucking thing? Oh, this fucking thing? This fucking thing does X, Y, and Z. And they go, oh, cool, okay. And then they just walk away and you go, oh, holy shit, obviously that's going to come in later. I mean, yeah. Prometheus has a really bad... They do it really bad in yeah, Prometheus. Really bad in Prometheus where they just show you this med pod. Like, oh, what's this fucking thing? You know? It's like, oh, it's a med pod, but it's only designed for men. Exactly. Like, and usually oh. these things, again, they're establishing, like, we have this... We're going to use it later so you don't ask where you got it from. But it's so obvious. Aliens does a really good job of disguising that. Yeah. Um, Until later when you're like, oh, that fucking thing. Yeah. But you, you, <laughs> like, it's, it's, it doesn't stand out when they yeah. first show it to you, right? You're not sitting there going, oh, what's this fucking thing? Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you see, this, that scene's about Ripley proving her worth and they hide it in there so well. So good. Yeah. So now that, now that they're on the planet and they're investigating the facility, um, the Marines are super jumpy. They're all scared. You know, they're serious, but you can tell, like, nobody believes Ripley, but they're all a little afraid that she might be telling the truth. Yeah. And eventually they discover, like, the acid blood leftovers, I guess. Like, somebody, there's there's been a firefight and something burned a bunch of holes through the floors. So they realize, like, holy shit, like, this woman might be telling the truth about this acid blood thing. That these aliens have acid for blood. And, you know, they're using their motion trackers and they get something and they start freaking out and they start to... Uh, they, they almost kill Newt, the little girl. <laughs> and this is when uh, Ripley has to kind of like step in with her sweet mom skills. And they're all, you know, they're all jumpy and afraid and want to shoot first and kill. And she just dives in head first with a flashlight to go get this poor little girl and save the little girl. And then Hicks uses some some secondary dad skills. Yeah. <laughs> some sweet dad skills. Yeah. And this is when you first kind of uh, get introduced to the little trauma family. Yeah, the little trauma family. <laughs> yeah. Um, the character of Lieutenant Gorman in this movie, they when they're when they're doing the drop from the ship down to the surface, they 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 make a note of saying that he's you can tell he's inexperienced, that he's never done any actual combat drops yet. You know, the ship is rattling as it is breaking down into the atmosphere. Hicks is taking a nap because he's just the coolest motherfucker ever. Um, <laughs> and Gorman is clearly like shaking there, kinda like getting a little bit nauseous. And when they go in to find the colonists deep in the actual uh, facility and uh, everything goes to hell. The, the aliens start coming out of the walls, start killing everybody. Gorman freezes. He, you know, like I said, he's, he just doesn't know what to do. And this is another one of those scenes where Ripley's like, God damn it, I guess I'll do it. And Ripley takes over and she she, she gets in the armored car and she saves the day and saves, all the, saves the Marines they can save and gets the hell out of there. And that's when Gorman uh, gets knocked on the head and uh, has like a concussion and he's knocked out for a bunch of the movie. Yeah. Now this is deliberate too. Like you, you don't really realize this. But like why would they send in such a green inexperienced lieutenant? Well, because the company is manipulating these things, I guess, right? 100%. Like, they deliberately want a guy who's useless running this so Burke can have his way. You don't know this yet in the movie because Burke is still this nice guy wearing a nice vest. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's all very deliberate. And Gorman has a nice retribution scene at the end of the movie where we realize, like, yeah, he is a good guy. He just didn't know what he was doing. But it's not his fault. Like, there is a large conspiracy against all of them. And Ripley's telling them, like, God, we're being fucked. And none of them believe her. And just slowly, more and more and more, it's being revealed that, yes, Ripley was right about everything. And Ripley has to take charge. It's like, fine, fuck, I'll do it. But that's what we want to see from Ripley. Ex Being right about everything, you take a charge. <laughs> exactly, but it's not. It's not Ripley's. Excuse me. It's not Gorman's fault, right? No. Like it's not. He's not a bad person. He was set up. They were all set up, you know. But again, mm -hmm. Ripley's right. <laughs> One of my favorite parts about this movie is how they improve the female side of her character. Yes. In the first movie, you really do get the sense it was not necessarily a story written for a woman. It yeah. was changed by having a woman there. But the story itself didn't really matter. Whereas in this one, you have those mother moments with mm -hmm. her caring for Newt. At one point, they're sleeping together and like having a nap together. And it's very sweet. And you get to have these feminine, soft moments of Ripley that show that she's not all hard edge and follow rules by the book, no feelings. Yeah, I mean, at one point, she's very soft, trying to get Newt to come out of her shell because Newt's, Newt is mute. At this point, like, she won't talk to them. Yeah, and it's like her little surrogate daughter because exactly. her daughter died. And so she's still, this is her time to come to terms with the fact that her own daughter is dead now. And she never got to be a mom. Mm. And so you kind of play that, but it's never taken to a point where she's, like, crying and upset. Yeah. And, like, they don't take it far enough that it feels tropey or forced. Yeah, they give Ripley more feminine moments, but they don't mm -hmm. change the character of Ripley. You yes. know, in the first movie... She doesn't have those feminine moments. You can tell, like, they just had Sigourney Weaver act those 
moments in the script differently. Yeah. You know, whereas this time they're like, no, no, like here's some feminine moments for Ripley. Yeah. You know, but now all of a sudden she's not a hysterical, panicky <laughs> idiot woman who's yeah. just like, oh my God, there's a girl. You know, like, yeah, like we have to save her. Yeah, like <laughs> my daughter. I don't know why she has like a showtimey accent, but whatever. <laughs> it happened. It's it fine. happened. <laughs> Um, but this movie also does a really good job at explaining her skills and giving her opportunities to gain more skills Mm -hmm. without having it feel like forced, like with the power loader. And then in this moment, that's one of my favorites with Hicks teaching her how to use the pulse rifles Mm -hmm. and the guns and all of their weapons, because Ripley has never used them before. They had thrown together flamethrowers in the first one like they didn't really have guns and so he's actually teaching her and it's never taken as like a how dare you don't know how to use guns from his side and he's just genuinely wanting to keep her safe because he he cares about her you get this this really subtle romance plot that's not super forced but like it's just a tenderness and a yeah, soft not, moment. It's not inappropriate for the situation. Yeah. And and back a step here, you know, when with the pulse rifle, it's a machine gun with a grenade launcher built into the bottom of it. Yeah. And <laughs> Ripley says, "Come on, hey, what's this thing do?" And he's like, "Oh, don't worry about that." She's like, "No, no, I want to know how to use this weapon." And he's like, "All right, let's do this." Yeah. Like, you know, she wants to be competent, she wants to be trained, and she can handle these things. And you know, to Hicks's credit, he trusts her with that. Yeah. You know, like. You wouldn't just give a grenade launcher to a goddamn kid. He's not showing Newt how to use a grenade launcher. But he's like, no, no, this woman knows what she's doing. And I, don't, I shouldn't just give her the beginner course. I should show her all facets of this. Mm-hmm. And it is really a sign of great filmmaking and great storytelling on a part of not only the directors, but also the actors in mm-hmm. being able to capture these moments of emotional shift in this movie which does a particularly excellent job because it gives you that break from the action yes the stress that you really need but it also has to feel natural otherwise it'll feel like jerky and it'll kind of play with your emotions in a way that brings you out of the movie yeah. but this kind of pulls you in further and it's it's a really uh, yeah, it's it, a really beautiful moment it's a tender moment about guns <laughs> yeah right? like <laughs> Hicks and Hicks and Ripley don't go for a walk down the corridor, yeah. you know, and pick flowers that should not be in there. You know, they're just they're kind of doing that cliche of like, you know, where the man goes around to a woman like, this is how you work on your golf stroke. But they're using a gun yeah. in the middle of a siege, you know, so they kind of figure that, that they find out a way to put that, that cliche moment of like, oh, you just kind of lean back into it. You bend your knees right there and you just drive it in, you know, <laughs> with a fucking gun. With a so gun. It just works. Yeah. yeah. It's perfect. It just works. And like you said, really does a good job of bringing you back down so they can send you right back up right like just, yeah and gives you these nice now now you see that now you care more about hicks too though yeah because ripley cares more about hicks you know what yeah. i mean so it makes you care about these faceless marines i mean there's even a part early in the movie where they confuse the names with hicks and hudson right like yeah you know and now he as a character is, is starting to stand out which spoiler alert hicks is my favorite character in this movie <laughs> i love ripley but hicks is actually my favorite i definitely maybe sort of kind of have a giant platonic man crush on hicks <laughs> yeah anyways yeah this is actually a great scene too to lead into one of nick's next favorite moments um because after learning about the gun ripley gets to keep the gun yes which she's going to use to protect her and newt while they go take a nap Mm -hmm. because they're all exhausted at this point (laughs) we need a break damn it (laughs) so ripley does the smart thing and she you know finds a safe area that has security cameras it's a lab it's empty they can lock the doors and she goes and it's got beds for her and new to take a nap and bulletproof she takes a, glass yeah bulletproof glass and she's been a, got a big goddamn machine with a grenade launcher on it so ripley has done her due diligence but surprise burke's a fucking asshole <laughs> and burke sneaks in there takes the gun locks her in there and turns off the security cameras so now and then he also throws in the two face huggers to get them uh, impregnated with the aliens so he can smuggle them back in Yada, yada, yada. As Ripley wakes up, you know, she's, again, she's no gun, no way out, no help. So she's got to figure out a way. So Ripley, the character, now has to figure out a way using her her intelligence, using her her, her guile and her creativity to, to solve this problem. Like, who, how does Ripley get out of this? 
you know, like with two goddamn face suckers running around the room, and she's got to you know fight them and and still save the day. And you know, protect save, Newt. And protect Newt, right? So there's a lot going on, and Ripley mm-hmm. figures out, uh, I'm going to set up the fire alarms. So she she saves the day with a lighter. Yeah. You know, and then the, the Marines come crashing in. They try to smash their way in. You know, and you know we we've already seen that that doesn't work because Ripley had to do it, uh, <laughs> just banging on the glass of the chair, being an, being a fucking animal, and then uh, Hicks comes crashing through the uh, the glass after they shoot it all to hell, and yeah, so it's just it's a it's a neat scene to show you that she's just resourceful. Mm-hmm. You know, she's in, she doesn't give up. Like they're they're fucked. Like what do they do? Yeah. You know, she's got to save a little girl. She's got to fight two aliens. And she's got nothing to do with it. So yeah. how does she get out of it? Like, and she does it in a in an intelligent way. Yeah. And just yeah, like cause she's a fucking boss. Yes. So this kind of leads into why this is my favorite movie of all time, and why Ripley's my favorite female character of all time. Uh, as a kid, I was just Mr. GI Joe. Everything was just GI <laughs> Joes. And this movie is basically just GI Joes in space versus monsters, right? Like just the soldiers, guns, <laughs> monsters, just everything I fucking love. Yeah. Um, and this is just what leads into. You know, like said it multiple times, is badass Ripley two guns. This is why I like her so much. It's just this simple. She's an awesome, strong, competent <laughs> character with two guns. She takes a machine gun with a grenade launcher and duct tapes it to a flamethrower, and she goes and she kicks a bunch of ass. I mean, at this point, everything has gone to hell. Everybody's pretty much dead. You know, everything's gone to hell. She knows what's down there. They're about to escape. Yeah. And she but newt's down there newt is down there trapped and she doesn't give up on newt she knows that these aliens are likely not going to kill newt they're likely yeah. going to take her down cocoon her and impregnate her with a with another alien using a face hugger so she knows she has time and so she gets her guns she gets her, her like her extra flares and her grenades and she <laughs> charges down into the depths of hell basically you yeah. know where they, everybody else died that no one else could do you know she charges down in there head first you know how badass is that? That's all I really need, right? Is a strong character in an interesting situation. You know, yeah. that, that's about it. Like, it's that simple for me, you know? So they just did a good job, and I love it. Same. <laughs> so one of the other most famous scenes in the movie is is the final battle, where we're back on the ship, and Ripley, who has sweet power loader skills, <laughs> uses a power loader to battle the alien queen. Yay! You know, this is the famous, like, get away from her, you bitch, scene where Ripley comes out of the little side hatch and she's got this, like, basically forklift armor. And this is just, it's just so over the top. It's so ridiculous and it's just so awesome, right? (laughs) You know, like, she doesn't have a gun anymore. There's just this, what what do I do against the the queen alien, the the biggest of all aliens? Well, I got to fight it in hand-to-hand combat. It's like, it's so over the top, but it's just so cool. The biggest alien you've seen. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. They, they can't use their guns on the alien because they're in the spaceship. So yeah. if they shoot this alien, it's going to bleed acid blood over the goddamn place and they're all going to die. So she's got to she's got to fight this thing in hand to hand combat <laughs> and fucking throw it out the, the airlock. Right? right out the airlock. It's just awesome. <laughs> and it's just what a way to end the movie. You know what I mean? What a way. Like and then, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, because then it, it wraps it all up with like her bandaging up Hicks, and yeah. she puts she puts Newt to bed. And, yes. Like it's all very like. And she even puts Bishop to bed, right? You know, she Bishop does. at this point, the android has been ripped in half by the the Queen Alien, and she even puts him t- to bed too. So they're they're a cute little trauma family. <laughs> Uncle Bishop can come, you know, they can all just relax and go home. Yeah. Right. And that's one of the really interesting things about uh, Ripley's character too is that. Early on, they established that she does not trust Bishop because he's an android. And the last android, I guess the only android she's probably ever met was Ash. And Ash tried to kill her because he went, he, he A, was programmed to work for the company. And then he went crazy when they were when they were trying to defeat him, um, when they were trying to stop him. Yeah. And he tried to shove a goddamn magazine down her throat. <laughs> a rolled up magazine. Yeah. And um, the most brutal way to kill somebody. Yeah. In, and what the like, fuck was that? Any movie. Yeah. I, I don't know if you see that a lot in movies, but he's just yeah, yeah, shove this fucking magazine, this rolled up magazine down your throat. Jesus yeah. Christ. And so as the movie progresses, you know, Ripley begins to trust Bishop. You know, Bishop is really, uh, he's also a very competent, but he's a very soft spoken character. It's really quite interesting the way Lance Hendrickson portrayed him. Yeah. And she, she, she learns to trust Bishop. You know, at first we are supposed to trust Burke, the human, 
mm-hmm. and kind of have a distrust for Bishop the Android. Like, oh, Bishop the Android's going to work for that evil Wayland Utani company. But as the movie progresses, you realize, oh, no, Burke's the fucking scumbag. And, <laughs> and Bishop's actually just a regular, nice old android here to help. And Ripley, you know, she doesn't hold that against him that he's an android. She doesn't, she's not biased against him. She's not prejudiced against him. You know, at first she's scared of him because obviously trauma, yeah. um, you know, PTSD going on, on there a little bit. But then, yeah, as he proves himself, you know, oh, yeah, I can trust you, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, they become friends, and she takes the time to make sure, like, even though he's torn in fucking half, <laughs> to put him in, and tuck him into bed. And he's an android. He can. He doesn't have to go to bed. No, he nah. doesn't have to go into stasis. Yeah, she wants to make sure he's okay, too. So she cares even about, technically, a piece of equipment. Yeah. Right? Because she's just so a good cute. person. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I love their relationship. Yeah. That's actually, out of all these movies, out of all the Alien movies, the only part that still creeps me out is there's a scene in the movie where someone has to crawl through this extremely... Like, this movie's got a ton of tunnels in it. Yeah. But they can, like, walk through the tunnels. They can crawl to the, through the tunnels. They take Bishop's character and they put him into a tunnel where he can't even crawl. He has to shimmy through it. And oh. even if this is just Lan Hen- Lance Henriksen in, like, a 12-foot section of tube on a set somewhere, just the idea of that creeps the fucking shit out of me. That's the scariest part of the movie to me. Yeah, like his arms are completely tucked up into his yeah. chest and it's just this slow little wiggle. Yeah, it's a worm wiggle. Ugh, it's oh. horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I get like physically uncomfortable. I'm yeah. like squirming on the couch. <laughs> Still can't deal with that one scene. So so good. Yeah. Ugh. But Ugh. I feel like Lance does such a good job in this role and i love the dynamic between that him and sigourney weaver can pull off between the characters Mm -hmm. like the subtle nuances to their relationship and how it's almost as if bishop knew like well it was very clear that bishop understood that ripley didn't like him yes but he did such a good job at consistently explaining to her what he was doing why he needed to do it Um, what he was programmed for. He explained all the rules of robotics, how he wasn't allowed to hurt her, like how the programming had changed in the 57 years since the one who tried to kill her. (laughs) And he just handled her with such care and like... Yeah, he's the only like, one that believes her the whole time. Yeah. He, yeah he's the only one that like, takes her serious. He's the, he's the only one who isn't like shortcutting her and being like, oh yeah, whatever. You know, he yeah. he's he's competent too, right? Like he... he He's trustworthy eventually. Like, well, he's, I think he's trustworthy the whole way through. Like, I, yeah. I, you know, I don't want to say he's not trustworthy just because Ripley doesn't <laughs> trust him. You know, he's a, he's a very soft, tender character. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, who, uh, and it's, yeah, you watch their relationship grow, right? Not just like her develop a new relationship, but he has to start at the bottom. Yeah. Right? And, you know, there's these moments where like they try to give him a gun. And he's like, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> yeah. And then when, uh, you know, at the end of the movie when they're about to take off, you know, Ripley says, like, how much time do we have? He's like, oh, plenty of time. He's like, we're not leaving it. He's like, we're not? And he doesn't try to yell at her and be like, no, no, like, we got to go, man. Like, he's like, yeah. okay, yeah, go save the girl. Like, I trust you. you yeah. Know, you know what you're doing. Yeah, and there is there is a moment where they do, like, a little, like, fake out. Yes. Uh, which, like, oh, it's, when you watch this movie and you kind of forget this moment where she comes out having rescued Newt and the ship is gone. Yes, Bishop is and gone. And just like, Bishop is gone, Hicks is gone, they have no way to escape, I th- I think the she plant even... is blowing up. I think she even says, God damn you, Bishop. Yeah. She's like, yeah. <laughs> like, she's like, no, I knew it. Yeah. And then he like, he floats down because he's like, I couldn't stay landed anymore. Yes. Because the ground was too unstable. And you're yeah. just like, yes. <laughs> Fake out, I am trustworthy. So, yeah. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Yeah, and they have a tender little moment Yeah. Yeah, at the end of the movie where they're back on the ship, you know, where she's kind of like, you know, basically like, thank you, Bishop. And then the Queen Alien rips him in fucking half, <laughs> and he's spitting milk everywhere, and it's fucking gross. And it's just like, Jesus Christ! And it really makes you care about that moment. It yeah. makes you, like, feel it. Yeah. Ugh. Like, just such a good movie. There's oh, yeah. a reason Sigourney Weaver... Got a got a nod for yes. this movie, which, at the time, aside from I think maybe Silence of the Lambs, was one of the first horror movies to ever get like Academy nods. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, Silence of the Lambs is later on, right? Yeah. So yeah, like Sigourney's the trailblazer on this one, yeah. right? Yeah. We're on to Alien Three now, where we actually get to explore a little bit more of their relationship too, because there's a couple cute little tender moments between Bishop and Ripley and yes. Alien Three as well. 
What's left of Bishop? What's mm. left of Bishop? Ooh. <laughs> so, following the events of Aliens, Hicks, Newt, and Ripley are in cryo tubes, and a fire starts aboard the ship. They are then jettisoned along with the damaged remains of Bishop in an escape pod that crash lands on Fiorina 161, commonly known as Fury a foundry facility and penal colony inhabited by male inmates, many of which stayed voluntarily after they found God and some form of salvation there. Hicks is killed in the crash and Newt seemingly drowns in her tube. The prisoners find the crash and the passengers, and as they carry away the bodies, we see a face hugger approaching one of the prisoners' dog. Ripley is awakened by the prison doctor Clemens, played by Charles Dance. Who informed... Tywin Lannister. <laughs> Tywin. <laughs> Very young looking Tywin. Oh, he's awesome in this movie. <laughs> so good in this movie. Yeah. Um, he informs her of the passing of her fellow passengers. She is warned by the prison warden Harold Andrews that her presence may be quite disruptive and suggests that she do as much as possible to not draw attention to herself. For her own safety, of course. And he also tells her that the corporation has been informed of the situation and they are sending a rescue ship and they should be there within the week. Fearing a xenomorph had caused the crash after finding some acid melt damage on one of the cryo chambers, Ripley insists on an autopsy of Newt, which shows she did in fact drown. But to be safe, she asks to have the bodies cremated, during which an inmate named Dylan, played by Charles S. Dutton, gives a eulogy. While all of this is happening, the alien had time to gestate within the dog and has since burst out and grown into a four-legged alien that begins killing inmates. Now, this is kind of one of the first times we learned that the aliens take on a lot of their uh, host features. Yeah. Yeah, they're not just all man-shaped. Yeah, like the reason it was so humanoid was because it came out of a human. Came out of a human. Yeah. But having it come out of a dog. Dun, 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 dun. By this point, we get to see Ripley with her shaved head, and she is quite brazenly mixing with the inmates. She even goes up to thank Dylan for his words, but he replies insisting he is a rapist and a murderer of women, so she shouldn't try and become his friend he very clearly doesn't care for her <laughs> yeah he even says like it's not personal we just don't want women here i mean there's yeah. like there's 25 men and then a little bit of staff yeah and they they're all very much disturbed by like their order is being disturbed by yes. the presence of a woman ripley and clemens grow closer through the coming hours days it's not super yeah. clear and they eventually sleep together after recovering the <laughs> and they eventually sleep together <laughs> Period. Yeah. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Nothing really else to that. Yeah, it's just kind of like, I've been out here for a while. <laughs> yeah. I've been out here for a while. You've been out here for a while. I need to feel something. <laughs> yeah. A little, little trauma. Yeah. You know. Not good. Not great, but it happens. <laughs> After recovering the remains of Bishop to access the ship's records, she is attacked by four inmates and rescued by Dylan who re-educates them with a pretty brutal-looking beating. With a lead pipe. <laughs> yeah. The lead pipe of knowledge. <laughs> Bodies are slowly being discovered, and the warden is continuing to deny that anything is wrong. But when the alien kills Clemens in front of Ripley, and then kills Andrews in front of all of the inmates, they can no longer deny what is happening. Ripley bands together with the inmates, and with the help of Dylan, they make a plan to trap and kill the xenomorph. Since the prison has no weapons, they have to get pretty creative. Unfortunately, the plan fails, so they must find another way. Ripley, still suffering from pains in her chest that she believed was due to the sudden awakening from her cryo chamber, discovers that she was actually impregnated by the queen facehugger that had escaped the ship. After all that fucking time, man. <laughs> I got her when she was taking a nap. <laughs> Fuck. This also explains how she escaped unscathed after the alien had killed Clemens in front of her. Knowing she must die to end this cycle, she asks Dylan to kill her, but he refuses to do so until the adult alien is dead. They put together a new plan to use the mold at the lead works to kill it. With a few hiccups along the way, they manage to do just that, but Dylan dies in the process. Wayland Utani has now arrived and cornered Ripley, promising to remove the queen from her chest safely and kill it. She refuses their offer because, of course, she definitely doesn't trust them anymore. Yeah. 
that came all this way just to take it out. Like, no, 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 it's all right. Yeah, we promise we're going to kill it. Definitely. Ah, nah. We swear. And instead, she falls backwards into the still lit furnace, clutching the freshly burst queen to her chest to ensure that they die together. Pretty epic death. Yeah. The yeah. Kind of <laughs> wrapping up the saga of Ripley there. Yeah. It's a pretty good movie. Yeah, I think it's a really good movie. Uh, sequels tend to follow this formula where they just take the first movie and then crank it up to 11. And that's what Aliens did. You know, they there's a small crew and they have very minimal weapons and then there's one alien and then they take aliens where there's now a bunch of marines you know and then there's a bunch of aliens and there's a bunch of, it's just a bigger version of that movie and so they were kind of left with this problem of like well how do we take aliens and crank that up to 11 so what they kind of did was was they just went back and made a movie that was a bit derivative of the first movie where there's only one alien um they have no they don't have the right tools to deal with the problem you know, they're all kind of stranded in their, in their, in their surroundings. Like, what do we do? Um, and in a lot of ways, too, the movie is the exact opposite of the second movie. In the second movie, they're well-equipped and well-prepared. They have all this technology they can use to help defeat the aliens. And this one, they have, like, no technology. Like, they're literally using candles and, like, shovels <laughs> and shit. Like, they just have nothing. So they, they try to do an approach where, like, okay, let's go back to the first movie. You know, at the same time, let's do the complete opposite of the second movie. And a lot of people don't like it for that reason, where they just think it's just kind of, again, derivative of the first movie and, like, not a good follow-up to the second movie. But I think the movie holds up great on its own. I really quite like it. Yeah. And I think there's some amazing actors in there. I mean, Sigourney Weaver, again, obviously is amazing. You know, but I love Charles Dance and Charles S. Dutton's characters in this movie. They're just fantastic. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They also do a really good job of bringing in her softness, her newfound gentleness, especially with Bishop, because at the one point she has to go and take his head and arm is all that's left of him mm -hmm. at this point. And in order to read the logs of the shuttle to find out and be absolutely sure that there was some form of alien life on it with them. Yeah, it's like it's the black box scene where they yes. take the black box from the shuttle and yeah. Yeah, and so she hooks him up to that and he says some things along the lines of like, I can't feel my legs, all those things. And he helps her. He gives her the answer she's asking for. He apologizes a bunch, which is so yeah. sad. Um, because he's like, I can't give you all these answers because, like, all he can do is read off of the box. Yeah. And at the end, he asks her to shut him down. Yeah, that's right. And essentially kill him because he's, he's like, they, they can refurbish my body, but I'll never be top of the line again. And he knows that, like, there's no saving him. And yeah. it kind of gives this weird like sentience and autonomy to a machine. Yeah, the toaster stories. is suffering, right? Yeah. yeah. So And it just, it gets at you so sweetly yeah. and and it's very unfortunate because that happens right before the scene where clemens dies yeah <laughs> so everybody ripley cares about dies mm -hmm. <laughs> you know there the one of the things you notice with these three movies so far is there's kind of a scale of the amount of romance in the first mm -hmm. movie there's no romance for ripley's character at all she's got no sexual tension really within the characters um there's no romance at all the second movie has a, a bit of a slow you know burning kind of budding romance with hicks yeah and then the third movie she's just straight up knocking boots with clemens you know so <laughs> yeah. let's just get it on and so you, you watch ripley have uh have more uh romance in these three movies yeah and there's this there's a point right after she saves her head where she actually asks him if he still finds her attractive yeah. which can be seen i guess a couple different ways but like i see it as she has spent so much time suffering running being scared fighting for her life that like having this downtime, the first time in a long time she's felt yeah. even relatively safe to want to feel human still. Mm. It's like you can be a badass woman and still want to feel pretty. Yeah. Which I think is really good. Like some people might look at it and be like, well, how dare she want to be pretty? It's like, but also she's been through so fucking much. Let her be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Like, let some guy find her attractive in this, like, one moment. And so I actually found that, like, really sweet and touching for her just to be like, do I still look yeah. okay? Like... And then they kill the motherfucker. <laughs> and then they kill him. <laughs> and that's kind of the, there's like a tale of two Ripleys in this movie where there's soft Ripley and then there's hard edge Ripley. And at the beginning of the movie, when she's paired with uh, Dr. Clemens, um, this is soft, romantic Ripley. You know, like, there's, there, she's in a world of shit. You know, and there's still the threat of the alien, but she, you, you see the softer side of her, 
you know, where she gets the romance story where she, she wants to be pretty still. Yeah. Um, cause you know, the plant has a really bad problem with lice. Yeah. Um, so she has to shave her head. And then when that character dies, when, when Charles, uh, when Charles Dance's character Clemens dies, you know, soft Ripley dies. And then we switch over to Charles S. Dutton's character of Dylan. And that's, he's this really hard edged, like violent character. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is where, you know, fighter hard edge Ripley has to come in and take care of the problem. Like, you know, like, hey, no more tenderness, no more softness. Now it's it's all about struggle and survival and... and yeah, and he actually pushes her almost to a next level mm-hmm. of her desperate fight because after she finds out that she has the chest burster yeah. inside, she wants him to just kill her. Yeah. Like, just kill me, handle the alien on your own, essentially. Yeah. Um, and... Or, she doesn't know. She doesn't know when this thing's coming out. She's not. No. She's not necessarily trying to quit on them, but she's got to get rid of this queen. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, way more people are gonna die. Yeah. But the, the character of Dylan realizes that um, they need her too. Like he. Yeah. yeah they need her too to help yeah. them defeat the other alien. Like yeah. Like if you if you, uh, you if I take care of your problem, that's one thing. But what about our goddamn problem? Yeah. You know, and yeah. she and she wants to help them too, right? She doesn't just want to quit on them and, and sit there and. and you know, but mm-hmm. she's, it's a very emotional movie. Yeah, it's, for compared to like the other ones, like this, what the other ones cranked up the like alien stuff to an eleven. This one cranked up the the emotions and like the drama almost. Well, yeah, it's about in a lot of ways it was about hiding the the negatives and accentuating the positives, right? Like mm-hmm. you know, like what can we do that we the other movies didn't do? Like let's use more of her emotion. Like she's just fought and fought and fought, and now she's got one of these fucking yeah. things in her. She's strung out. She's yeah. at the end of her rope. She has avoided the lava floor, and then fuck, now she's just stepped on it. Like you know what yeah. I mean? Like what do you, what do you do? Very, very intense movie, and they also bring that that emotional intensity into the end. Yes. Where, where Wayland Utani Corp decides to just dig that knife in a little deeper. And they bring in the person who they modeled Bishop after. Yes. So they bring in the face of this android that she actually connected with and trusted. And they're like, they're going to trust me. Like, yeah. she'll trust him. <laughs> like one one more sleazebag thing. It's yeah. just like, oh, hey, remember me? <laughs> and it's not, it's pretty vague at the end whether or not it's actually uh, the real bishop or it's another android yeah because they hit him in the head with like a i think it's a, a wrench yeah a wrench or something Big heavy wrench yeah and he's instead of spitting out milk he's got blood on the side of his face but this his ear is like hanging off the side of his head in a very strange way yeah and you're like oh is he a robot or not and it's deliberately been kept very vague i don't know why yeah. they did that but they did yeah so just one more dig to poor ripley <laughs> yeah. ah here's your best friend he wants to betray you too fuck yeah. me Right. Which I think just extra pushes over yeah. the edge in her Christ-like fall position. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, after this point too, like this is just after the death of Dylan. You know, Dylan sacrifices himself to save her. Yeah. You know, he fights the alien in basically hand-to-hand combat yeah. to give her time to save the everybody. Like at this point, it's just kind of just the two of them. Yeah. You know, there's a the two there's of them. One other guy. One other guy. And yeah. he's, he sacrifices himself to save that one other guy, you know, and not really Ripley, right? Like, yeah. you know, wow. It was never really necessarily for her. No, because he has to sacrifice himself to kill the alien. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the, one of the most famous parts about this movie is the fact that Sigourney Weaver had a shaved head. <laughs> you know, that's that was really this kind of, like, I saw that parried a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. Right? And it's just like, oh, my God, she's got a shaved head. There's there's this weird thing that kind of happened that around that era where they were taking white women and shaving their head. I mean, there was you know, there was Sinead O'Connor, but there was, um, you know, Ripley had a shaved head. Then uh, Robin Tunney's character in Empire Records had a shaved head. And then uh, Demi Moore and G.I. Jane had a shaved head. And it was this weird kind of thing that where people were like, oh, my God, wow, like, look how pretty she still is, even though she's ugly because she has no hair. Like, you know, like how brave of her to, to shave off one of her best uh, features. You know, this is really... It was this, like, faux girl power thing where they were, I don't know how to explain it, like, they were saying basically, like, yeah, like, wow, that's so brave of her to abandon her beauty. Yeah. But it's like, it's still these very gorgeous women, they just have really short hair. Yeah, you know? like, it doesn't really change how pretty they are. Yeah, exactly, but it's just, oh, this makes them intense. Like, it's, yeah. it's they were really kind of obsessed with that for a weird little period there in the 90s. I don't know why, but it was, yeah. it was quite common. Yeah. I do like how... The, the idea of, like, shaving your head now, especially after something like Furiosa, like, the shaved head 
on white women has come back yeah pretty pretty furiously even with things like the like the half shaved head and like yeah. those kind of haircuts making like a really big resurgence in our pop culture and i like the idea of them kind of being like my hair doesn't matter mm. like kind of throwing off the shackles of the yes. patriarchy and saying like fuck you like i don't need hair to be a woman like having long hair doesn't make me female yes like it doesn't matter i am who i am with or without my hair or whatever all my piercings like all the things that women are now like using to almost liberate themselves away from this idea that like men own their bodies <laughs> well again uh people going through chemotherapy you know when men do they just whatever mm -hmm. got no hair but women do you know it, it was very common for them to wear like a bandana yeah or like never mind just a, not even just a wig but like an actual like a bandana like you know yeah. here's a woman with no hair like oh cover up your shame and like that's fucking weird man but in these <laughs> movies yeah you know like those are the tough women because they have no hair yeah you know, don't care? Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I guess. It's like, oh, if she has no hair, she must be strong. It's like, no, there was a lice yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in, like, Empire Records, it's because that character is suicidal. And oh, G.I. Jane, it's because she's in the army, right? Yeah. You know, I think that it works for Alien because it's just, um, it's a stark style choice. Mm -hmm. You know, it just all oh, just looks, it looks interesting, right? Like, yeah. it's just, you know, it's kind of a part of the identity of the movie. It's like, oh, this yeah. is the one where she shaves her head. Yeah. You know what I mean? It also kind of fits with the idea of, like being less noticeable at the prison too like her clothes are all very baggy oh yeah yeah she's she's, um, a, she's assimilating to yeah that population. she's assimilating a bit because yeah. she's a very much like this is these these movies are very much the story of ripley the outcast yes. you know people don't listen to her people don't take her serious in the second movie she does assimilate with the with the marines she proves herself and and this and in the third movie yeah there's this weird part where she kind of becomes one of them but they're still not comfortable with her mm -hmm. you know but they slowly realize again she's the competent one she's the one who's in charge she's the one who has the plan and they they know it you know, they, they know to trust her you know because she's again she's just like a leader character right she, you know, yeah. she's a she's a leader um the first three movies seem to have a really clear story arc for ripley yeah but then they decided to make a fourth movie yes and uh i think i'll let nick sum this one up for you guys <laughs> yeah a little bit of background information on alien resurrection so i was it came out in 97, so I was 13 at the time, and I never saw any of the other movies in theater. I, I didn't see them till 94, I believe, but just because the way time passes when you're a kid, I remember thinking, like, even though it only been five years between the two movies, I remember thinking, like, wow, like, Ripley's coming out of, like, Sigourney Weaver's coming out of retirement for another <laughs> alien movie. Like, wow, it's been so long. Like, I never thought in my life I'd get the chance to go see an alien movie in theater, and, uh... We went and saw it, and it's terrible. It's, it's a fucking <laughs> shit movie. So basically, you know, it was the mid to late 90s. We were obsessed with cloning sheep. And so this movie <laughs> is about cloning Ripley. And at the time, we were also obsessed with these, you know, with bisexuality and kind of quasi-lesbian teasing characters. <laughs> so that's kind of really all the movie has. You know, like, it's, it's just not a good movie. I apologize if you like it. That's just my opinion. And I remember, like, when we were done watching the movie in theater, I went with my dad and my uncle. I remember just kind of being like, wow. Like, even as a 13-year-old, just being like, wow, that, that wasn't very good, was it? And my dad and my uncle just kind of look at me like, no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, it's just not good. Don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Okay. Um, in a time where there were so many badass female protagonists, why was it that you connected with Ripley the most? Well, like I said, you know, Ripley had cool guns. And that, <laughs> at that time in my life, that was kind of the big thing. The other thing, too, though, is that, like I said, did you, as I watched all these movies, it came, became very apparent to me that Ripley was a strong, competent, intelligent, and capable character. You know, mm -hmm. and it's, that's what I want from, like I mentioned earlier, that's what I want from these kind of movies. I want to see, you know, I want to see people succeed in interesting situations. Like, that's where I don't want, like TV shows like The Walking Dead, where you're just watching shitty people fuck up for extended period of time, periods of time. <laughs> it's exhausting. I had the same problem with Breaking Bad, where it's just like, yeah, like, I just don't have anyone to root for. Yes. And, you know, like my other favorite movies when I was a kid were the Terminator movies. But in Terminator 1, the character of Sarah Connor, she's just a screaming damsel, right? Yeah. In Terminator 2, uh, Sarah Connor's nuts. Yeah. You know, she's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, she's a good character. I like her. Like, you know, Linda Hamilton does an amazing job in both oh, those movies. Yes. But, like, to me, Ripley was just cooler. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, like I said, like, those are the characters. I, I gravitate towards those kind of 
I guess people would consider them kind of limited characters, like, mm-hmm. but those are the characters I like in those kinds of movies. Some of my other favorite movies are movies like uh, Casino, you yes. know, or, or Heat, um, where they have flawed characters put in difficult situations. And those are really interesting character study movies, yeah. you know, and I don't dislike science fiction or action or horror movies that have flawed characters, but like this is in a weird way, these are feel good movies. <laughs> For me in particular. That's one way to look yeah, at it. It's G.I. Joe in space versus fucking monsters. And they got sweet guns. And as a kid who grew up on G.I. Joe's, like, this is all I wanted. So I have that legacy, that nostalgia. Yes. But again, like, you, you, you dissect these, these movies. And, you know, say what you will about the third one. But if you dissect the first two movies, I mean, they're just genius artists yes. working on these movies behind the camera in front of the camera behind the scenes you know there's just amazingly talented people working on these projects you know some of my favorite comic book artists of all time uh jean Giraud, mobius he designed some of the suits um in the first alien movie oh, cool. i mean giger is just fucking insanity like i believe that <laughs> genius borders insanity and hr giger is an example of that yeah you know? um <laughs> There's just so many talented artists working on these movies, and they're just like these movies will hold up forever. These will be, oh, yeah. you know, these unfairly. Here's a tangent about, here's a sidebar about Hollywood. Hollywood does not treat science fiction movies with any respect, and no. Hollywood is built on science fiction. You know, movies <laughs> like Star Wars and Star Trek get relegated to like this joke, and they made so much fucking money. They, they, you look at the top 10 grossing movies of all time and with an exception of um titanic i I think titanic and maybe one of the fast and the furious movies (laughs) they're all science fiction yeah right like these are good fun movies you know all the top earning franchises are all science fiction and so for some weird reason you know hollywood just shits all over these movies i don't know why but when you really break these movies down i mean like i said there's they're just the amount of talent yeah you know and just genius in these movies is undeniable Mm -hmm. and that's why they stand the test of time you know hollywood has this weird obsession with period piece movies that are dramas (laughs) you know and that's kind of like he said like yeah like sigourney it was it was surprising that sigourney got nominated for aliens right yeah you know she lost to marley martin for a movie called children of a lesser god and i've never heard of either of those things so (laughs) yeah sorry neither you know what i mean i'm sure it's a great i'm sure she's a great actress and i'm sure it's a great movie but i mean you know, go to any any place in well, you can't really go to any video rental store anymore. But you go any place <laughs> that sells movies, and they probably have a copy of Aliens hanging out there. So yeah, yeah. So fuck yeah. you, Hollywood. No, just kidding. <laughs> take that out. The artistry and the creativity in these movies is undeniable. The yes. storytelling, the the character building. Because you wouldn't have such a strong movie without such strong characters. Yeah. And that comes down to actors. That comes down to so many different aspects, so many different gears turning to make something so incredible, something that connects with people and that you can love as a kid because of guns. And (laughs) (laughs) yet you can grow up and you can look into it later. You can watch, I don't know, documentaries, extra features on your blu-ray re-releases and you can enjoy it so much more and you can get more and more into it i think that's one of my favorite parts of storytelling and so one of my favorite parts of just getting to talk with people i care about and people i like about all the different characters that they love Mm -hmm. especially the women ones because you know (laughs) that's what this podcast is about yeah so i want to thank you for coming on and talking about Ripley and thank ranting about Hollywood. <laughs> thank you for having me in our guest room. <laughs> We're recording crudely. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to plug before I sign the show off? Yeah, I actually make my own webcomic called Life the Necropolis. Uh, surprise, it's basically just G.I. Joe's in space. <laughs> Uh, the tagline I have for it is science fiction adventure comic book about a wandering mercenary. I always describe it to people as basically a cross between a Star Wars and Good, Bad, the Ugly. Um, it's just me, like again, just drawing G.I. Joe's in space, having the time of my life. Uh, you can check that out at my website at lifethen.com. L-I-F-E-T-H-E-N.com. I'm on all the social medias. I don't have a 
standard tag unfortunately because a bunch of them were taken here and you just can't, i couldn't get them all the same but i'm on twitter instagram facebook tumblr i'm on all those things so but yeah going to the website lifethen.com is probably the easiest way to get it and i you know i, I write it i draw it i color it I, I do everything myself so and i'm so proud of them thank you <laughs> and i don't make a goddamn thing on it so you want to give me some money for it buy a shirt <laughs> shit <laughs> You can find us wherever podcasts can be found. Please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow us on Tumblr, Twitter, and Instagram at WenchBenchPod. And if you want to reach out, you can send us an email at WenchBenchPod at gmail.com. All of the art for The Wench Bench was designed by the wonderful Tessa Joyce Reekin. You can find her on Twitter at Wherevile. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Bye. Goodbye. Have a pleasant day. Oh my god, you and your goddamn rules. These women with their rules. My name is Fonda.